We're hoping that um, we'll have some lively debate today. I'm Diane Schwartz. I'm the um, group publisher of PR News. We um, deliver information, networking, news, insights on the public relations trade through our weekly, our website, conferences, awards, etc., etc. Um, and we have Andrew and Jay here today to debate um, why marketing and PR um, are not you know, acting as one and in unison. And um, today's session is sponsored by uh, MasterCard and Prime Research. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about, I think most of you have MasterCard in your pockets, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, our two um, sponsors today. A MasterCard generates millions of conversations each week on social sites. Its award-winning conversation suite is a web-based analytics tool supported by a global team that monitors, analyzes, and engages in conversations globally 24-7. The data mining analysis serves as a foundation for active engagement, strategic decision-making, serves as a barometer and resource to the business. And Prime Research is an engine that powers their conversation suite. Um, Prime combines talent with technology to gather relevant content, deliver accurate data, and provide research-based consult consulting for better decision-making. They um, have offices in nine international research hubs that manage brand and reputation in 64 languages. Um, they serve brands like MasterCard, GE, Walmart, GM and many more. Um, we have some prime research folks here today. Um, I'll talk to them afterwards. And so, if um, Andrew and Jay, if you could just briefly um, tell the crowd about yourselves, and um, then we'll get started. Okay. Uh, I'm Jay Bartlett. I head up global digital marketing and e-commerce at Pippi Bose. Um, a job. Um, that's only two months old for me at Pindy Bows, and, and previously I spent 15 years with uh, Xerox as a brand, um, and in the later years around digital marketing, social, and content. Great, good afternoon, Andy Bowens. Uh, I have the pleasure to head up our corporate and digital communications at MasterCard. Uh, I joined the company about three years ago after working for brands like Oracle, Dell, Amazon, and Sony, to name a few. Um, Really, what we're going to talk about today, my role has been part of a three-year journey to transform MasterCard into a digital enterprise. So the combination of tools, technology, big data insights with best practices in brand publishing, uh, meeting with traditional PR and marketing has been our, our journey and our purpose. So. While you're talking about that journey, can you describe that journey? I mean, what has it been like and where is MasterCard right now when it comes to social? I always think back to when I know Brian at a, a conference in New York, if anyone doesn't know, know a former barbarian guy is at Perk Lake now as one of the founders. Someone asked him that question once when he was on the panel, and his response was great. It's like, you can't really score yourself regarding social, because social in particular is so involved to sit back in your morals and think you've got to figure it out. Um, it's just a shit point that you're going to uh, fall apart. Where I would say, though, in three years, we've moved social and digital away from traditional uh, models of like, share, and audience building to a model of uh, enterprise listening. And from listening across 43 markets and 26 languages, across social, online, digital, and traditional, we're focused on delivering insights into the C-suite, the product group, customer care marketing, and comms to inform our strategy. So we built the tools. We've started to develop some know-how that I think is uh, industry leading, and now we're trying to grow and mature with an opportunity to demonstrate how social media in particular can contribute to the P&L versus a traditional PR and marketing. Um, so related to the topic of why are marketing and communication so separate, can each of you, starting with Jay, describe what your organization looks like in the marketing, the PR, even, you know, we've heard a lot about customer service being a big part of social strategy and even IT. So what does it look like in your organization? Whether that's a good thing or not right now, what does it currently look like in the day-to-day -day basis? 
So we have um, marketing and communications ladder up to a CMO. Um, so for hidden bows, um, you know, we would consider that together, quote unquote. Um, you know, I think part of this panel discussion we should kind of poke at the concept of together to what degree, um, you know, we mean that because I've got personal beliefs um, that the togetherness actually has to be very um, significantly more so than what we see today. Um, so we're together, we ladder up to a CMO, and then you've got, you know, you've got on paper, you see an organizational structure that is very communications and very marketing on, on kind of two sides. Um, and the, the belief, because we're together, is that we're inherently working together, connected at the hip, um, and I would challenge that notion. I think there's elements of intersection, um, but um, we're far from a perfect state um, where there's one single place. Yeah, look, I'm biased 20 years in communications. I rotated in marketing roles, and I'm a recovering marketing guy that loves comms, so I'm biased. I think communications right now is the golden age for PR professionals. The challenge that I see, and Jay and I have debated quite a bit, is that whether you're in marketing or whether you're in comms, are we growing up and maturing on our skill set into the model that's required? So a traditional PR person today has to be a big data analyst. They have to understand code and content and how that works and surfaces and publishes on the networks. They have to be amazing PR people and storytellers. And I think communications people are inherently the storytellers of an organization. And that's really, in my view, where I see marketing and social digital media moving. So this is our opportunity as comms people, as communications professionals, if we don't mess it up. And unfortunately, um, I see around our industry, I mean, we have dialogues and struggles we've had as a team. It's really hard to break old habits. And if we don't grow up and take the opportunity that's in front of us, it's too easy to meld comms in as one of the channels within the marketing mix. And I think that would be a, um, a tragedy for people who have dedicated their careers to communications. It's funny, your, your, your point around, you know, you see this as the golden age for communications and, you know, how you have to be the storytellers. And it's, I would absolutely say the same for the marketing side. Um, you know, so this is that point where it's kind of this intersection of the comms world and the marketing world kind of um, coming together. Um, you know, 10 years ago in your world, Andrew, you know, you'd have an organization that was probably 20 or 30 people, depending on how large the brand was, focused on media relations, investor relations, um, you know. And then we did clip count. And clip counts and all that good stuff. And so the concept of storytelling and social has kind of changed the rules. And, you know, I would say conversely, you know, on the marketing side, 10 years ago, we were very tactical. We were, you know, I, I'd liken it to, um, order taking. Um, you take a lot of direction from business units um, on what they want to do and it was very tactical. Um, I think part of this discussion today is about we're all communicators now um, and so yes there's an organizational structure called communications um, but the lines of that as a functional organization are starting to kind of break down and it's becoming now a part of our everyday lives as quote unquote employees not even just marketers or communicators. Yeah, I think the order taker, we joke, the traditional PR model at MasterCard up in the bed three years ago, we called it the deli cabinet, right? So you were prized and valued at the end of the business cycle when they needed PR and someone would walk up to the counter and say, give me half a pound of tweets, give me a press release, and get me a PR in the Wall Street Journal. It's just a shame that we allow that as professionals in our craft, allow that to continue. Today with big data, insights, understanding of how content's discovered and engaged with and how it can influence third party advocacy, whether it be traditional media, whether it be government association and consumer directly. That's the opportunity in front of us. And again, I think if we don't step into that and involve our function, it's too easy to make the argument to put the data counter in under the CMO and just make it simply the media relations component of the marketing mix. Andrew, do, do the, does a marketing team at MasterCard see communication as the deli counter? They try. Uh, I think we're, we have a fantastic partnership with our marketing team, but I come from a big Irish family, so I, uh, 
the analogy I would use is Sunday night at the dinner table. Someone has a couple of drinks, you have a good meal, and you start debating. So I'm passionate in debate with our marketing people that social and digital cannot be measured as, here's my classic line, you just spent $5 million acquiring likes and shares across Twitter and social, and you say you have an addressable audience of 5 million people, and you hold it up as brand, but if those 5 million people are just blankly staring at you doing nothing, what's the impact of it on the business? Let's change the dialogue to, if you have five million people and they're engaged with your brand in a conversation, are we able to mine and understand who those people are? What are they saying about our brand and what insights through conversations can we drive out of it to inform a marketing digital strategy, a public relations push, customer care, or better yet, go into the C-suite and get the pulse of the consumer or the merchant, in MasterCard's case, and give them insights that they can make business decisions on in real time. That's the opportunity. And at MasterCard, comms is not that charge, where we still see, I'll just give one last example, a colleague of mine proudly presented in an executive review that they acquired 10,000 new followers in one day on Twitter. And they were unceremoniously thrown out of the room with the quote that I could get my mother to sign up for Twitter today and say, I'm the CEO's mother at MasterCard and she get 10,000 followers, so what's the big deal? And that was a really a big eye opener for us too. Social has to mature and we need to change the dialogue of what it is and the insights in my mind are the thing that will set the table for communications to get that seat in the boardroom and stay in the boardroom. What unique skills does a communicator bring to this and a marketer where they can come together? I mean, what are the, if they're not the same, the different um, skill sets, what, what are the two that are ideal? Yeah, I touched on some of this in an earlier panel where we have some fun kind of building the Frank end marketer, which was, um, a, it's a great discussion around kind of what the future uh, looks like here. Um, there's, I think, a new person and new talent that we're talking about. But we're also talking about um, a different structure of organization. So as you look at an organization, organizational chart on paper, um, we should come back to that and talk to that a bit more. Because again, as we talk about together, what does together mean? Because together, I mean, you know, just said, it ladders up to the CMO, we're together. That's not together in my eyes. And so we should come back to that a bit more. Um, the types of talent, we talked about storytelling, we talked about big data. Um, you know, and we've also talked about the daily counter. And I think it, as you start to think about all that and all the things that are shifting in the marketplace, um, uh, we're meeting talent that has um, more of a motivational, so I mean, there's different attributes that you're looking for in, tech, in talent today. Um, it's less about kind of tactics or fun functional expertise, um, but the ability to motivate and change, um, the ability to um, politely push back and say no to all of those that are requesting um, things at the deadline. Um, that, that's kind of what I'm looking for right now. The, the functional expertise is so widely accessible in the marketplace, either through talent, through contractors, through agency resources. It's less of a concern for me to move from point A to point B to get somebody who's really good at SEO, to get somebody who's really good at UX or design. It's looking for the people who are the change agents who are very strategic, maybe have non-market backgrounds, um, and to kind of help facilitate this significant uh, shift that has done. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think is driving the model for new skill set is I saw some data the other day, a uh, paraphrase, but I think it was uh, YouTube in 30 days publishes more content than the networks did in the last 60 years. Twitter is something like 1.4 billion pieces of content of content a month. Facebook is exponentially more. And it occurred to me, me, my team, our industry, we're a bunch of content polluters, right? We're all in love with the idea of publishing and the idea of potential audience reach. But at the end of the day, I think it's cluttering up the channels with non-relevant content that I'm not believing people are seeing in general. So what do you need? You need a new skill set, whether it's in content or marketing, that says, you know, let's move from big data to micro data or small data. Let's understand how to segment an audience and how does the technology from the algorithms of SEO and discovery work against 
shareable types of content. And then we have amazing people who understand how to create third-party advocacy and wonderful content that means something to the audience. I don't think we, as an industry, have stepped back and really valued the first parts of the profile of the new person. And then, uh, just to com compliment uh, what Jay is saying, you know, here's the hypocrisy in what I'm saying. The CMO came over to me today and said, come and work for me and let's integrate comms and marketing and have publishing for PR on the ones team. I'd say, probably okay, but the organization has to be mature enough first. And what Jason is right, you get polite collaboration from your peers, but nobody's doing the one ecosystem, one team, you know, Together. One piece of content. Yeah. Okay. So this concept of togetherness I mean, out um, to our audience, uh, raise your hand if you're feeling that togetherness, togetherness in your organization. Huh? Can you share like, what organization now that's working? It could also be that you're not, Netflix is not like a legacy company with a lot of the years. Yeah, so any company kind of, you know, that's made, you know, their name well known within the last, you know, six, seven, eight years, I think are probably a little bit more aligned with where you are. Some of the larger brands have such a traditional, uh, if, if I took digital marketing, my board chart today, which I'm going through a process to kind of optimized for the future, but if I look at it today, I suspect it's the same work chart from 20 years ago, um, which is the problem. Um, and this is where we've got to start thinking about kind of bringing the togetherness and defining the togetherness um, where we are multifunctional, um, literally physically sitting together. Um, we're doing some great work right now with Digitas, who's our um, lead agency, as we're doing some transformation work. And it's fascinating to go into their offices as they are set up on the account, on a full account basis, where UX, account management, creative, technical, they are all literally sitting together in a 20 by 20, you know, kind of conference room for, you know, 10 months as we go through a project that I'm working on with them. That's not traditionally how advertising agencies are usually account management on one floor. Media is in another building, you know. And so there's, this is rampant, this, this kind of mistreatment of togetherness. And so I, I, get, I get excited by Digitas and coming together like that. We need to start doing that. And we need to start doing it um, with a customer at the center of that universe. Um, so it's not simply just taking all of marketing and all of communications and saying, we're just going to pull you guys all together and physically put you together and have you report out to a CMO. We're going to actually start to put it around kind of clusters of customers or user segments. So it should be based on segmentation um, and build that out where comms and marketing, um, as well as you know other elements, well other functional elements, all matter up to the same boss, the immediate boss, not the ultimate boss in the CMO. It's like my immediate day-to-day -day manager is the same for marketing. I'm not aware of any organization that is set up like that today. Is it, what I'm referencing, is it anybody set up that way today? So you would be with a team of you know five, six, seven people with all different functional kind of backgrounds centered around a particular customer or segmentation, and you all matter up to the same boss.
So it's a step in the right direction. It's the step I'm taking um, at Pitney Bowes, where um, you're aligning yourself around businesses, right? So that's still problematic because it's introverted. Um, but that's what I'm going to do is set it up around um, business units because what somebody mentioned cultural before, and, and that's truly what this is, and so these cultures won't change overnight. And so you've got to start to organize yourself in almost kind of a step process. So with your eye to the future of being fully audience-based versus business unit-based. Now there's overlap there, but there's also a lot of differences between business unit and audiences. You know what I think the uh, I think what keeps barriers up right now when it comes to social media, uh, I think we're all maturing in this space, and we agree. You said this this morning in another session is that social media hasn't quite proven that yet to be a direct correlation to the bottom line or the P and L. And what I see, and I'm probably guilty of it too, is that uh, fear of exposure on the programs we've created uh, prevents me probably from letting everybody in. So. I give an example, right? A classic marketing person would want to have uh, show up and show leadership. Biggest audience of the competition, massive amounts of like and share, and package it in a way that looks impressive. But if the CEO is on his game that day and he says, okay, how did that $20 million investment, $5 million audience acquisition translate into our quarterly result of shaping our P&L? You're usually like one of those gasping moments for air. And then you call it brand and panic and get out of the room, right? And then the PR guy says, wow, oh, those marketing guys are stupid. What we gotta look at is, you know, the brands are defined by the conversations people are having around them. So let's look at our shared voice compared to the competition. And let's organize all the data, not into metrics, but into insights so that we can tell everybody what's wrong around the brand and hopefully solicit action. Customer care, they're like, well, social media, we just had this discussion, you know, I heard in a meeting lately, of, well, if we move customer care to social, that's an acknowledgement that we know these X amount of conversations are happening, so what are the risks if we're not ready? Well, they're happening already. So I think those are three examples that lay at the point of a little bit of fear of exposure because our industry hasn't completely matured and grown up yet into the C-suite discussion of P&L. We keep our silos, we keep our story tight, and we try to kind of move along and evolve. I think you have to be mature in a company and say, okay, amnesty month. Take the silos down. What are we trying to do around each customer and how from insights to technology and platforms to smart content strategies can we align to help achieve some of the goals of audiences that Jay was speaking about. If an organization is that mature, then I would happily let marketing come and work for comms. <laughs> would, you, would you say the CEO agrees with that, that this togetherness concept and you know what role does CEO play in social strategy? Um, no, I don't think most CEOs of very large brands are fully aligned with what I think we're talking about here, which is a very modern perspective of what togetherness is. I mean, we've been talking, uh, we were at this event with Sam a year ago, and we weren't even having this particular conversation at that time. It was about how to invest in social media. But it's, you look back at it, I mean, 12 months ago, we had such kind of siloed, kind of functional approaches, and, awesome. and, we're, and we're talking about social, and everybody, mostly, everybody that I'm aware of in social, that now is a part of the social media team. You're one to five people, you're off to the side, you feel undervalued, you feel overworked, you're always on, all this good stuff. Um, but, that, but there's a problem there, as you said, you're sitting off to the side, and so it's, for us, in our, in our position where you're meeting very large teams to start kind of poking at this concept with your peers, um, with senior management, yeah, ultimately out to the CEO, but it's, it's starting to think through this audience first kind of organizational structure, which is just, I, I've never seen it. I think if we were all given the opportunity to do, you know, like there's that old uh, arcade game called Sim City, if you can kind of build something on your own, I think we'd all sit here and acknowledge what we're talking about here is, of course, how we go about doing it. The challenge is, as a big brand, it's not easy to get from here to there. That shareability is not simply, uh, simply done. So I think it's a journey. I think the alignment to the business units that we heard from the audience, and certainly that's where I'm going, it's a step in the right direction. Um, 
an uh, earlier panel, I also referenced the, the, the need for understanding and demonstrating the value of the entire journey, content journey. Um, and that's when the CEO will perk up in the chair and split you to demonstrate what that journey looks like and how it derives a value to the business. Because let's be honest, social and content marketing is some sort of thing over there that gets in the way of kind of reach out. You know, I, we are privileged to have a CEO who is very attuned to digital and social marketing. Three years ago, he scored us as a company that won out of 10 on digital which came with its challenges because probably if I reflect back on what I've built together, if you get a score at one out of 10, you want to prove to the CEO very quickly that you know what you're doing. So it becomes an arms race. So a year ago, Jay and I, uh, and I was in an arms race mentality. It's like, I'm going to be marketing and the rest of the organization into our social presence. So in two months, we set up Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, started looking at everything, and we were just in love with the idea of having a brand and presence. Then we rejiggered our agencies and started spending both loads of money on what we thought was wonderful content and pushing it out and polluting. And what we didn't realize until we had a partner like Prime is that you have two beers and one night, so listen twice as hard before you speak. And with all this capability that we built, I had limited to zero insight into the actual stakeholder we were trying to influence. So we had to put on the brakes, get the arms race down, go across the hall, talk to marketing, talk to customer care, and it keeps going back to what Jay was saying. Get the organization to mature and say, around the customer experience at MasterCard, whether it's consumer, merchant, government, issuer, employee, what do we want to achieve, and how do we take these investments together to help improve business? Not to mention when you're in an arms race mode and then you do an audit at the end of the year and the CFO comes down and says, this joker spent X million, this joker spent X million on the same thing with their flavor, this joker spent a bunch of money, I don't know what he's doing. You start to become exposed and when you're having a CEO discussion about all of a sudden social is a 20, 30 million dollar proposition and it looks fragmented without purpose and no direct correlation to the PML, you're in a bad spot. 20, 30 million dollars. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so what was marketing, your marketing counterparts doing doing this arms race? What was the same thing? Same thing. Without we were all going to prove to the CEO that we were better than all that can. And that first burst of activity with every department or group got into the fuel board and how they they set up either allegiances or something didn't have money or you took your money and you went to stuff where you started setting stuff up about the next executive committee you do, you go, hey, I don't know what he's done, but let me show you what he got done. And it's a fool's errand because at the end of the day, a smart CEO says, okay, how does that help the bottom line? And at the end of the day, nobody in that scenario is thinking about the customer as a total touch point journey kind of perspective. You've got an advertising team putting money behind it to amplify and, and, and their impressions on the, you know, you've got a content team that's all about writing and storytelling, but it's kind of in a vacuum and unrelated to kind of the amplification and distribution strategies. Um, I mean, that's the whole point around this panel today. That, that's what we have to start moving to break down is those individual silos, um, because the CFOs and the CEOs are becoming more in tune with this than anything I've seen historically on the traditional side of market. You know, in the past, like 95% of the budget would just go towards advertising. So the budget's becoming fragmented. There's not the money that advertising used to have. There's another panel going on right now around is advertising dead, and I would argue yes, it is. Um, and so now it's it's the budgets are not kind of overwhelmed by advertising as a single entity. It's now multifaceted, and to a degree, it's aligned to a customer journey, but they're not all connected. Why is advertising dead? I mean, even on social. I mean, I mean, advertising serves a purpose. It's just a very different purpose today than it, than it was 10 years ago. My background's in advertising. Um, when you're going through a rebranding or a repositioning of a brand, it's very purposeful to kind of get that scale and that reach. Um, but to continue to look at advertising as the all things paid media and distribution is a flawed approach. Um, 
And so I think that's, you know, I think it's the end of course, advertising app is acting like they're dead because they're scrambling to every dollar possible in this new ecosystem. Some from native and, and everything else that's going on. So it's, it's breaking down quite a bit. It's interesting too, just on that quickly too, having data and insight in an RTX to set up all of these channels where they have to pay your spending money, but we're blown away when we took time to read and do our analysis. 82% of the dialogue and interaction with consumers when the brand happened on Twitter. So then you start looking at the expense line across the board, and it, it, it kind of sucks there. Because you're like, we got to be big kids now, no matter what the trend is for whatever social network, if all our customers are on Twitter, let's get a purposeful strategy across audiences and get Twitter running, then take the run and get to another channel. Yeah. At my former employer, we did a nice little program. It's funny how smaller budgets bring more, you know, you, you, there's a bit more scrutiny sometimes tied to some of these smaller budgets, and I don't know why that is, but we, we did an initiative around one of our businesses, around one of our verticals, um, and we worked in this kind of together approach, and we measured it not in what I'd call normal blocking and tackling metrics, if you will, likes, shares, follows. Um, things like that, but we, we measured it um, around our ability to increase our voice in a particular customer set and to measure our influence within that customer set over time. Um, if it wasn't for us to understand how much influence we were driving, uh, the program would have been pulled about four weeks in um, because the shares, the likes, and everything were minuscule. We were investing about $500,000. But the minute you looked at how much we were getting advocates, meaningful advocates in the healthcare space to speak about our brand and share things, it's the power of, you know, you know it's a bit more around less is more. Um, really powerful stuff. Now, if you take that and I build that into my new, my new um, org structure that I'm thinking about deploying, you then start to do that again around customers. The reason it was so successful is it was based on kind of the audiences in. Um, but now we'll be able to kind of fully define that and set that up and measure it back to the audience. I don't think people in general have got it, but we always say what happens to the CEO sticks his head in your office when you can say the three minutes you have. And the great question we always kind of challenge ourselves with is that if the CEO came down and said, what's the deal with digital? What's your answer? And I think a lot of people who are so focused on workflow management and tactics, if you step back, they might not have been our answer for us is we use digital to break third party advocacy through media and folks their associations with governments that would gain the value that we create beyond the payment of the national guard. So that gives us the focus. Everything we do is to create a third party reference for what we do. It's kind of that Apple thing and look at that and that's what we're trying to build. At least we have purpose and strategy. Then we can go to marketing and customer care and say, okay, what are your collective goals? <coughs> then are we collectively doing something that's going to impact the customer? We're just starting to be mature enough to talk about that together now. Yeah, and this goes back to what kind of talent you need today. You need a, a, a lot more leadership within your organizations um, who have the chops and the ability to educate. They almost want to, you almost need educators and motivators as part of your new talent. Um, what I would tell my CEO if they popped in and said, what's going on with digital? I would say today, and traditionally, at Pitney is centered around email deployments, and we're very good on email deployments. Um, but the conference executive board did some research around b and and found that 57% of the purchase decision is made before contacting a supplier. So my responsibility is to be along for the entire content journey from the minute they start in a search box on Google all the way through purchase where emails is just that one journey before purchasing a product, I need to fill the void of the other 14 or 15 that are missing, and that's what's going on with digital. Interesting. Sir, did you have a comment about the bar? I was
um, it makes the burden for legal review and workflow to be um, a little less burdensome. Well, that point. The difference is not only the legal part, it's yeah. more important. What we're talking about is, is engaging the third parties, understanding If you're a down counter and people like you and then they kind of roll their eyes when it's PR and that's, there's crisis, you're in a bad spot. But if you got the law, the legal team, you got the policy people, you got different parts of the org that generally wouldn't pay attention to PR unless there was trouble in their corner, suddenly respecting what you're doing, coming to the table to understand uh, content in terms of what our audience is saying, how can I be informed, then you're in just a branding spot and that's where the building PR comes in, and then you have the right to sit at the table, make demands on larger budgets, and prove your value beyond, okay, the planning's done, let's get the PR people in here to get some press. So thank you for your commentary, and I hope all of us are kind of winning the respect of the law, law department. Let's talk about budgets. I mean, that's a big, especially on the PR side, the PR never feels like they're getting as much. Um, every year than their marketing counterparts. I mean, do you agree with that first? And then how is it looking for 2015 for you guys in terms of spend on marketing, you know, different marketing and communication? More in social, and if so, what areas of social are investing on? I'm not gonna say numbers, but let's say if you were in the right to demand more budget, because if you have to change the frame, if you don't have data and a direct correlation or some way to frame, or back to the business line. You're usually going to get an income of flat minus five or doing more or less. You know, one of the things that we had to do is we went this digital journey. If I hadn't changed the thing three years ago, I'd have 65% more working dollars. So 65% of my working dollars, which used to go to agency or contacts now, fixed infrastructure and technology and license costs. So we had to actually take 35% of the working dollars in four years ago grow into digital, set up social, and activate ourselves with the traditional PR. It created the top pay Now we're at a point where the company is recognizing the value and we're in a position to show the numbers and insight why additional investment will accelerate the company business. So we're seeing incremental dollars coming in as we expand our seat, but we're always very cautious first to say we have a global system and we are the right path. Yeah, I mean, budgets are um, flat to down is kind of the, you know, what I would say um, I've seen and uh, what I've heard. Um, again, we're not able to derive a business value from what we're doing, whether the budget sits in marketing or communications. Um, you know, it's a ticking of the box from a CFO saying, yeah, we need to have a marketing presence, we need to have a public 
face. So, you know, here's a certain percentage of revenue for you guys to go do stuff and, and kind of find the market for our sales reps, this kind of perspective. Um, the minute we get this right and we derive that business value, these budgets will skyrocket. Um, and that's why we all have to focus on it. The presidents of our business units, like in any plan inside, was like, getting this much money and like this much revenue, getting this much more and I'll reach this target. We're used to just give us some money yeah. and help them yeah, invest. Totally. Right? Yep. So, I agree. The opportunity is ours to win and lose. It and it's fun. not easy. So I'm trying to do a bit right now where I'm looking at kind of multiple touch points in that journey that I referenced before, but I, we're not anywhere near as marketers understanding a full content journey and correlation analysis from what touch point you're able to throw something to make an action or buy, buy something. So that's probably years away, but we're having the beginnings of understanding how does this piece of content influence this content and what actions did you derive from that from a particular set, you know, prospect. So we're starting to get better at this, and the more that we piece that together, again, tell that business story, I think it's an open checkbook like, once you figure that out. Open checkbook. Pretty, pretty close. I mean, the amount of money that big brands are spending company-wide, once you derive a, a correlation analysis to the actions that you're doing in marketing communications to the revenue at the bottom line, it's going to be game-changing. That's why we're so focused on email. We know on our email, we send out and people open it, and click it, and then they click through and they buy something. We have an ROI, very specific ROI to that tied to revenue. Um, so now we need to do that same model all the way through so just one, just one quick example out of get money. So we worked with Brian, and when we launched our fast, fast digital wallet services, we came up with the idea that let's look at the after 13 million conversations the consumers had, 43 markets, 26 languages, and the barriers to entry for digital wallets. Took us six days and ten thousand dollars to kind of aggregate the data and then turn it into insights that we could get to the product or the marketing and use for products. We went and helped support the business, and I tell that story out loud. The anecdote, though, is that the head of research came to me six months later, 250,000 in the field, six months of research, and I got the exact same results. So what we did is said, OK, research team, think cons differently with your insights engine now, you can be repulsed with the consumer for 100 grand a quarter or whatever. We'll run these reports to validate your bigger studies. All of a sudden, the research money was coming in and it changed the profile of comps. Those are the opportunities that have great That's yeah, spot, that's spot on. on. And so now, what you're defining is the beginning of the fall of traditional research firms and then that is, right? Because there's a lot of that out there in conversations already being had that you can derive the same net result from that research. So, and it's kind of tied back to the advertising model. It's things like that. You, you start to derive different values from different things in the ecosystem and it's driving the significant changes in budget and strategies. So let's assume everyone in this room wants to go back to the office and you know, have an integrated communications approach, hashtag togetherness. And, you know, <laughs> um, practically speaking, what are a few things that everyone can do when they get back to the office to sort of move in that direction, start making a positive change in it? Like literally what the person I, I would do. I would approach it through kind of a scrum mentality um, is kind of how I'm working it with my team. And so yes, there's board charts and they're very, you know, you, you've seen them. Um, but now we've got to pull together some scrums, little kind of centers of excellence, if you, if you will, and build it. And I'm doing it around the business. Ultimately, it'll be around an audience, but it'll be around, around the business. And you ask for members of communications, members of strategy, members of insight, members of creative design, the, the social team, the content team. If you build your own little micro perfect state um, and you demonstrate a value around that. We did that at my former employer. It worked. The intent was to push it out into the business unit and the business unit wasn't ready for it. So we ultimately folded it because it wasn't, um, we just weren't ready for it. And that's kind of the challenge um, is readiness. Um, a lot of us here at this event we're all, we nod our head to this topic, um, but there's a lot of significant forces at play. So just chip away at it. Chip away at it with a little scrum mentality. I would have one tip is on communications worker and marketing folks that um, want to take this with us. 
organize, start a dialogue that seems complementary, not confrontational to what's happening in the works today. Focus the dialogue on, are we mining and understanding the insights that are happening? Instead of measuring likes, tweets, and audience size alone, do we understand the audience? And instead of having reports that tell us what we missed 10 minutes ago, do we have the capability to have predictive intelligence or insights from our social listening? Then do we did we took our media clip budget, the money that's spent globally by PR teams just to count clips every day, we put it to the center, looked for a good partner, we partnered with Prime, and built the capabilities to capture and listen in social, digital, online, traditional, and quickly get up to speed with the insights so that whenever you're sitting in a meeting, whenever an idea of digital and social comes up, not saying what's in place is wrong, but be the voice that says, well, did you know last week we had 45,000 conversations globally around product C, and it looks like there's a customer care issue coming up in the horizon that we're not seeing in the channels. Here are three things we recommend you do. You start getting people to pay attention then. They start thinking of communications differently, and once you give them a little taste of the data, it serves like a virus through the org. As soon as one organization or team has a success from it, they line up and it'll be a fancy bistro to sit down with the occasional takeout, but people want your data and want you engaged at the start of business planning versus getting some PR. That would be my Great answers. Does anybody have any questions or last thoughts on this topic? Yeah, Does it seem doable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it. Okay. <laughs>